television another chance to follow the story of the River Thames. Before the war, everything was geared to working up on the flood, working down on the ebb, mainly because we took advantage of every knot we could out of the current of this river. The craft would leave Tilbury behind their boat there, all bound for various wharves in London, coming up along one behind the other, uh, the large ships with the tug and attendants, the small coasters going to various berths like Hermitage, Carron Line, up through to um, Iron Gate Wharf, General Steam, Med Boats, a whole procession, very similar to the Lord Mayor's procession today, all with a common aim in view of getting up, getting tied up and getting done as soon as possible. This went on right to near enough to high water when they reached their destination. Then you would have a, a sort of a lapse of lull. You could feel it, sense it and you knew it was there and as the high water came, everything started moving down along, back down towards the sea, everything geared to the whole force of this river. This was, without any doubt, one of the busiest rivers in the world. But it was fascinating, you know, there was always something happening. Because there was a lot of craft underway, everybody knew what the other person was going to do. I always be tacking up here with a barge, tugs would be coming down to on their lighters and their craft. Uh, I didn't have to call them up on a radio like you can now. They knew what you were going to do. They used to read your mind cleverly and there was never any problem, not really. You would start to, to come up the river and the wind changed and it got slightly warmer. You knew you were coming home and everything was activity, waiting to go into the locks waiting your turn, tugs coming out, lighters, and now there's nothing, nothing. The, the whole atmosphere has changed and the docks themselves, are, if you had anything to do with Docklands or nowadays, it's so sad that the whole place is, is dead. The Thames once belonged to men like George Green, a tug skipper, Derek Ling, sailing barge master, and Bob Silver, a merchant seaman. Ships still ride the tides of the Thames, but most go no further today than the modern port of Tilbury, near the Thames estuary in Essex. Further upriver is desolation. There's been some revival in barge traffic with the rebuilding of the old Docklands upriver. Sand and gravels towed on the flood tide for the Canary Wharf development on the Isle of Dogs. A fifth of London's rubbish goes downstream in barges to be buried in Essex. But to those who knew the river in its heyday, it's dead. It's now once again a natural feature of London's urban landscape. 
The world renown of the Thames was always quite out of scale with its natural grandeur. Compared with the Nile or the Amazon or the Mississippi, it's a mere sea creek. It's famous because in the Victorian era, the greatest city in the world grew up on its banks. The first London was just a colonial outpost of the Roman Empire. The Romans crossed the Channel, landed in Kent and marched north to the River Thames. They built a wooden bridge across it here, just below modern London Bridge, when the river was much wider, lapping Lower Thames Street. Roman Londinium had a thriving port, but it didn't last. When the Romans retreated in 400 AD, their port and their town disappeared. The Saxons had a port upstream, but the Thames tides carried no significant trade for 500 years. It was 500 years after that, in the Elizabethan era, that the river took on a real economic importance for London and England. The great natural force of the tides carried ships far inland on the flood and out on the ebb. This linked London with growing industrial centres in other parts of the country. Coastal shipping gave England an industrial lead. Before good roads or railways, landlocked European cities were left behind as London grew, overtaking Paris in size in 1750. Historian Robin Craig. If you take a mile of London street and calculate the granite curbstones, the paving stones of London, if you then add to that the bricks of the buildings, the stone of the buildings, the Portland stone of the facing of the buildings, if you add to that the slates on the roof, if you add to that the timber used in the construction of roofs and floors, you have an enormous traffic on the Thames, which is just the building and the rebuilding of London. And all that traffic is being conveyed by sea. It is all coming up the Thames, and in volume terms, it represents the real important aspects of London's trade and traffic in the 17th right through to the 20th century. <laughs> The lorries of the river, the most local of the ships in the coasting trade, were the Thames sailing barges. Their special sprit sail rigging was designed so they could be worked by just two men. The form of the Thames barge evolved in the early 19th century, replacing an earlier, more primitive kind of sailing vessel. This kept down costs and made it a competitive form of transport well into the 20th century. One of the last surviving of the old barge skippers is Dan Wills from Gravesend. Started just before I was 13, taken away from school by my father. He'd taken his mate for the boy efforts. I thought I was going for a week. So that it finished up, I never went back to school anymore. I never got home for... I, I never got home for a 12 month. I slept with all the barge. I never worried, I was happy enough. I remember one time. It was all the time. We never knew what all the day was. My brother and I. So he said, where are you going this weekend? We said, we're going to Blackheath. Oh, he said, before you go, paint the decks round. It took us all day. We never saw Blackheath. And we knew we wouldn't. I said, that's Blackheath going up for a burden. Back come Parry, he looked at the decks. Oh, he said, they look nice. I said, yeah, no, of course they are. I said, have a nice holiday. Better rain job, pull her in, Martin. Take a rod in tight. Right, right, let your mind still come out. Some of the larger barges were seagoing vessels, like the Lady Daphne. Okay, there we go. Well, she's built in uh, 1923 to carry cement 
down the channel to Cornwall and bring China clay back. That's what she built for, and that's what she did up until 1937. In 1937, she changed hands from one company to another, and uh, she was running grain from the, all the docks in London down into Ipswich. And maize, barley, wheat, oats, anything to do with animal feed stuff. Because that's who the, the company who owned it then, that's what they dealt in. So uh, meals, cosy-tosh, anything. And uh, we did that for several years until uh, the last 20 years we did malting barley. And malting barley was being uh, done down in Ipswich docks. And we bring them up to the Royal Group of Docks. And that was the last cargo we actually carried in this barge, was uh, malting barley. Though they seem quaint now, the sailing barges had tremendous economic importance in the past. No great city could grow without building materials, food and fuel. On its tidal estuary, linked to all other parts of Britain by the sea, London began to take the lead. Its most significant cargo when it began to emerge as a world city was coal. Coal was first in great demand in the 15th century. It couldn't be carried efficiently over land. London's coal came down the east coast from Newcastle and was known as sea coal. By the 18th century, the trade in sea coal to London was the single most important employer of shipping. Captain Cook learned his seamanship on this route and his first explorer ship was a Whitby Collier renamed the Endeavour. A Whitby Collier also gave its name to a Thameside pub. The prospect of Whitby, one of London's oldest and most celebrated Thames public houses. It represents in its way the London coal trade because the prospect of Whitby was a brig sailing from the port of Whitby which was one of the many thousands of vessels in the 18th and 19th century that brought coal to London. Coal being one of the most significant trades on the River Thames. Coal for heating, coal for lighting, coal for cooking, coal for industrial use. And this employed a vast fleet of collier ships from the northeast coast coming to London to discharge their cargoes over the centuries. <laughs> What was the great monument to the coal trade? Surely it was the rebuilding of London after the Great Fire. It was found easy by authorities to raise a tax on coal because the commodity was required in such massive quantities. It was a tax that was easy to collect at the riverside. And it was from this great tax on coal that the rebuilding of London was largely financed. The great churches, the great buildings, including St. Paul's, were largely the consequence which does suggest just how important the coal trade was to the Port of London. London's dependence on seaborne coal continued into the age of electricity. The first power stations were built along the Thames so that river water could be used as a coolant. This is Battersea Power Station under construction in the 1930s, its chimneys towering above the river. Because power stations were built on the Thames, the most efficient way of delivering the millions of tons of coal they devoured was by ship. The men who manned the colliers were the unsung, unglamorous heroes of the London River. Kevin Greenwell, a liner steward, did a stint on the Thames coal boats. The very first time I ever saw a Tower Bridge close-up was when I sailed under it. Remember, the colliers were very low in the water when they were loaded, so you're almost like on the water line, and going under, I remember being on the after deck about 11 o'clock at night, winter's evening, and looking up, you had the span going across, and beyond that you had the floodlit twin towers. Absolutely fantastic sight. Once you get under the bridge, you then come into the city of London, which it then it got interesting for me. I, it was the sight I saw once you came into London, especially as you got near Parliament, it was like the same feeling when you sail into Manhattan or into Table Bay at Cape Town or under Sydney Harbour Bridge. I used to get a buzz out of you seeing it. Collier skipper Albert Dale. It was a good thing to be in Colliers because the work was steady. London needed the coal and the majority of people that were in Colliers were married men and they, they used it as a job, like a big truck driver, really speaking. They, they weren't far from home, so they, they could uh, always handle domestic problems without a great deal of trouble. And 
as London always needed coal, whether it was for household fires or power stations or factories or whatever, we still always had a pretty big demand for coal from the northeast coast. I could understand the colliers in short bread. I used to manage three, four months at a time, I could, as much as I could bear. Then I couldn't wait to get back to the liners. And I'd go away on the liners, do a couple of trips, and very often I'd be coming on leave, you know, a nice suntan, on the train from South Avenue to Waterloo. I'd get a taxi at Waterloo across the King's Cross, and quite often we'd cross Waterloo Bridge, and I'd see a collier going under, under the actual Waterloo Bridge. Now, the colliers weren't nice ships. They were black hulled brown housing, squat funnel, to sail under the bridges. And I used to look at those ships, you know, going on there, I was thinking, oh, wow, they're using them bloody me, mate. The coal trade provided a great deal of work for Londoners. It was one of the most lucrative cargoes on the Thames. Lighterman and tug skipper Bob Harris. There was the most awful crunchy noise down river. And down river we looked and there was a collier. It turned out to be a collier called the Charles Parsons. He'd been coming up and he'd hit the northern butments with his stem hard on. He'd, he'd hit the butments so heavily that he pushed all his uh, horse pipes and his steering gear right the way back, about eight or ten feet. And he was in absolutely no position to help himself. And he was just wallowing there like a drunken whale in, in, in the bridge hole of Tower Pier. We were quick on the job, we were there, and uh, we cleared the hook, got it all ready, and we waited for the magic words to come out over the water, and eventually they came. Because, after all, a salvage with a ship was something very, very unusual on the Lon London River. And suddenly this lovely sound came over the water and he said, will you take our rope, please? Will we take your rope? We put the rope on the hook. We towed him down to church hole. The poor old skipper made out the uh, count of what had happened. He said his steering gear had gone and this is how it hit the, hit the bridge. And um, we put our report in and we got paid out in almost record time. And I remember getting paid out in cash. 95 pounds, which in those days was an awful lot of money. And my wife and I, we were going to go to Margate or Broadstairs for our honeymoon, and instead we went to Paris. The coal trade and nearly all of the coasting trade has gone from the Thames. All the power stations, the gas works and the factories have closed down. The ships that had carried a more adventurous and exotic trade and which brought great wealth to London, are now museum pieces, beached like the Cutty Sark on the shores of the capital's history. London was the centre of England's foreign shipping. It was here that the great charter companies were established from the 16th century onwards. Royalty with political power and the city with economic power gambled on the risky business of sending ships to the far corners of the world to bring back valuable goods. London became the largest city in Europe in the days of the square rigger. Few now can remember life under sail. Robert Williamson sailed from the West India docks before 1914. We were home and bound and we were bound round Cape Horn. And we had a terrific storm which increased to full hurricane force. The only sail we had left was the main lower topsail. The skipper tried to heave the ship to, but she wouldn't come round because it had been too dangerous to try to get her to come round, so we just had to run on and run on and uh, trust the luck. Though we were all eyeing this main topsail, hoping it would hold, and to our horror, it began to split. We had a terrific job getting aloft and making the torn sail fast and setting the, the other half, which was sound. It was a, a job which was called goose winging by the old sailors. And it was only done in an extreme emergency, as this was. We steered across the uh, Western Ocean and then worked up the channel. And we docked in London, in the West India dock, on a Sunday evening. By the time we cleared up 
hauled up all the ropes and made the ship tidy. It was as was one was the custom in a sailing ship in those days. And finally, the mate looked around and uh, he said, all right, that'll do, boys. And they were the words which always marked the end of a voyage. The deep sea sailing ships brought back goods which were stored in London. By the 19th century, it had become the warehouse of the world. Its spices and other valuable cargoes from the empire were resold in Europe. The port of London was more than just a port. It was an emporium in which the world's goods were valued and auctioned. Thousands of Londoners made a living from this trade. Even a schoolboy like Bill Brown could find work as a paper boy selling to ships' crews from all over the world. I was about eight years of age, looking for money. And the only way I could get money was to go and get a job with old Flo Hart. She used to be a news agent. But the hours were half past five in the morning to about eight o'clock, half past eight. Two shillings a week. But I took it on. But one day she said to me, I want you to go down the Aberdeen Steamship Company. I said, where's that? She's just down up near Limehouse Pier. Where I learned to swim, that was. And she says, ship there, it's called the Aberdonian. It's got a lot of passengers, and I want you to take the basket and sell as many newspapers as you can. Right, oh, Flo, Aberdeen Wolf, the old watchman let me in, he never said a word. And I looked, I thought, it's a block of flats. I followed these passengers. Somewhere we went down below. I sold off my newspapers. Then I went to the cruise quarters. They was buttering me up, giving me tea and toast and sardines, this, that, and the other. I suppose I was aboard there about an hour. I thought, so I must save two for the captain. So I went up on the bridge, or the fella took me up there, one of the officers. I said, Captain, there's your papers here. Mrs. Mrs. Hart made sure that you've got yours. He said, what are you doing aboard here? I said, selling papers. Do you know we're all way down the Barsley River? I said, do what? The ship was sailing. I didn't know it was sailing. And I started crying. How am I going to get home? He said, son, don't cry. I'll get you home. He called a tug. Took me back to Limehouse Pier. As soon as I got to the pier, give me my basket. I was holding it under my arm. I said, run back to old Flo. She said, where you been? I was crying me out. I said, Flo, I've been all the way around the world on a ship. <laughs> Education authorities believe that getting one first-hand look is worth a dozen geography books. For this way, London's dockland rarely comes to life. The kids can see for themselves how cargoes are handled, quayside equipment, big ships and little tugs, all the colourful activity of dockside industry. Trade on the Thames remained lively until after the Second World War. It disappeared rapidly from the 1970s when the old river port, which had sustained London for centuries, died. Why that port disappeared is another chapter in the history of the river. Not much remains but the sand and gravel barges helping to build a monument to the wealth the river had created on the Isle of Dogs. A few craft have been preserved for the amusement of the new inhabitants of London's riverside. I think the life is quite pleasant. Uh, put a lot of hours in sometimes, but um, it was it was all right. You know, you really enjoyed it. You know. The Lady Daphne is now a pleasure boat, hired out for executive trips down the empty river. The most valuable cargo we, we carry is what we do now, which. Uh, passengers and people, you know, that's uh, a, a bag of corn didn't cost nothing, but people do, you know.
River Thames returns next Sunday at the earlier time of 5 past 11.